Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Commissioner Vestayer, thank you very much for being here. Uh, this is very nice. Thank you very much for coming. I'd better say that beforehand. That's good. Uh, the other thing we're supposed to say beforehand is any questions that you have, please submit them uh, to slido.com. That's how we'll do this. And just make sure you'll see uh, Salon H, the room that we're in. Uh, so we'll be taking your questions throughout. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, you have been called many things by many different people. You have been called uh, the world's most powerful regulator. You have been called uh, the tax lady from President Trump. Uh, you have been called the person who strikes fear in the hearts of Silicon Valley like no one has before. Um, and apparently, you, you've also been the inspiration for the cult hit political drama Borgen, which is amazing. Um, and there seems to be kind of two camps about you at the most simplistic level. One is that you are a hero. You are a needed check on uh, monopolies that have run amok. And you're doing that uh, for Europe and in some ways leading that for the world in a, in a, in a way that uh, no one else is doing. Maybe the other point of view is uh, you're interfering with free markets, uh, that you are uh, slapping fines on, on companies that provide goods and services and access that people really enjoy. Um, so I wanted to ask you as we start, how do you see yourself? How do you describe yourself and the work that you do and how do you think about that? Well, I think that as in most things in life, uh, it's in between. Um, and it's also, I think, uh, obvious uh, that the efforts that we do, it's a team effort. It's amazing people working day out, day in, uh, in order to make sure that we can prove our cases, the evidence of the case, the fact, the case law. Um, but the th why it's in between is that we still have so much promise from technology. I think we still have amazing things ahead of us, but we can only trust technology if we find that the dark side of technology is in check. And we're now on the third Google case. We've had a case with Amazon and eBooks. We've had tax cases, digital companies not contributing to the countries where they do great business. So we have this sort of, oh, let's, let's make all of that promise come true and let's make sure that it is for our societies to set the direction so that we know that we can trust what is going on. You mentioned the dark side of mm -hmm. technology. Do you feel like that is the more dominant side these days in this environment that we're in? Well, I think if you look at uh, sort of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where Facebook was strongly involved, uh, interference is the, in the very fundamental uh, our elections. Uh, if you see how we as, uh, as citizens becomes sort of uh, the production capacity or the production input uh, for part of, uh, of business, well, then I think you have sort of a, a situation where you need to, to take action and to take a steer. Uh, and we try to do that in Europe, of course, by the cases where we find that uh, we don't have fair competition uh, by the companies, but also our, our legislature uh, coming in. Uh, the latest was a, a platform to business proposal to demand of platforms much more transparency with the businesses that they host or the businesses that can only be found by using a platform. Okay, talk about the nature of competition mm -hmm. and your, your role as competition chief for the commission. Uh, that seems like that is a term, uh, a concept that can continue to expand a little bit. So um, I'm thinking, I, I wanna ask you about kind of competition and, and what looks like a healthy competitive environment? Is there a vision of utopia that you see? Uh, and I wanna ask you about the state of competition. Do you think it's alive, dead, somewhere in between? 
uh, when you look across uh, your work? Well, first of all, we see that um, we need to understand much better how value is created in a digital economy, how network effect sets in, so it's much faster than anything we knew. Second, that everything becomes digital. Like we see we had a, lot, uh, a number of agrochemical merger last year, and what we saw was sort of the tendency that, well, you do pesticides, you do seeds, but you also combine that with data, the weather, soil quality, how your plants are responding to the pesticides, uh, the frequency at which, you, at which you use it. So you know the very basic uh, part of our economy is also digitalizing. And the fact that this means quite a lot as to whether you can compete with better seeds, with new ways of, uh, of enabling these seeds uh, to grow and produce food for us. So we both have sort of an issue with speeds, uh, how value is created, and the fact that everything digitalizes. Uh, and this is why we sort of actively discuss if we need new and sharper tools to make sure that we as citizens benefit from competition in choice, innovation, affordable prices. What would those tools look like? Well, it could be tools concerning um, when should we uh, open a case, because maybe you're, you're sort of de facto dominant before you have become very big. Uh, maybe we need a, a second look at some of the mergers that happens when a giant company buys smaller companies that may hold sort of uh, a lot of innovative potential. Uh, how should we understand this in the future? And if things go wrong, how to make sure that we can remedy the situation? Uh, because it has been very painful, of course, to see uh, the lack of choice uh, when a dominant company misuses its, its position and businesses die, and that it takes us so long uh, to finalize our casework. So uh, the, the fines that you have brought against, uh, let's start with Google, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, it's in the billions of euros and dollars. Uh, have they made an impact? Have they changed? Well, well, we do see uh, we do see change, uh, but we're not in sort of in a in a concluding mode uh, as it is yet. Um, what we see is that there is a very strong need to to monitor uh, how things are developing because it, it definitely doesn't happen by itself. Right. Uh, let's talk about Facebook for a second. So uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, came out with his uh, post this past week uh, that has been called the, the pivot to privacy. And uh, one of the, the main messages of that post was uh, integrating the, uh, the back ends, mm -hmm. if you will, the data between Facebook Messenger and Instagram and WhatsApp. Is that a competition issue for you? Is that something you're going to be looking at? Well, when, when Facebook uh, bought uh, WhatsApp, we made the analysis to see if it would pose a competition problem if the two services were integrated and data was shared. And back then, we found that it would pose no serious competition uh, issue. But we haven't made the analysis if you look at the full integration. Uh, so that I wouldn't know yet. Uh, when it comes to sort of uh, this uh, pivot uh, to privacy, of course, I think it's, it's a most welcome announcement, uh, but it will, of course, be even better when put into action. It hasn't been put into action yet. Well, of course, I, I, I think it's a good thing that you announce what you're going to do, uh, but it is even better when you do it. Uh -huh. And if they don't do it, uh, what will you do? Well, privacy is not sort of in my uh, portfolio of uh, our work, um, but we do pay a lot of attention to, to privacy uh, because, you know, last year in, in Europe, we got uh, what you could call uh, digital uh, citizen rights, uh, that you own your data, that you can, you can move them, that you have the right to be forgotten. Uh, but we're still sort of in the process of, of making this come true because it's a good thing to have rights, but it's even better to be able to exercise those rights. Yes. And uh, I myself 
have this sort of personal frustration. I know I own my data, but I have very little or very few ways, if any, uh, ways to exercise my ownership. Yeah. Uh, so data portability, data ownership, mm -hmm. that's important to you as a person. And, and for Europeans as such, yes. and for the Commission, of yes. course. Good. Uh, okay. Um, uh, this is your, you told me this is your uh, first South By. Mm -hmm. And it is also your first time in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, and we were talking about uh, the nature of, of this audience in this room, and I would love for us to just try to get a sense of uh, who is in this room. Uh, so if, uh, as we talk about the, the commissioner's work, I, I, can we get a uh, show of hands if you believe that these tech giants uh, uh, have become too powerful and need regulation uh, that is not of their outside of, of their own uh, abilities to regulate themselves. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Texas. <laughs> well, everything is bigger here, no? Everything is bigger, uh, and there's a, an overwhelming consensus in the room. Uh, okay, well, that's wonderful. Uh, when, is a, when is a company too big? Can a company be too big? Is bigness the problem? I don't think bigness in itself is a problem, uh, because you're more than welcome to be successful in Europe. If people like your products, uh, the way you do things, you will grow, obviously. Uh, you're also welcome to be successful in that respect that you can, uh, you can have a merger with another company as long as there is someone to compete with you. Uh, if you grow yourself because people like your product, um, maybe that's a European thing, but if you're big, you also have a special responsibility. And that's a responsibility not to do things that will make it impossible for others to compete against you. So the little guy maybe do something to ah, make it in the marketplace that if the big guy did that, it would kill everything. So I kind of like that, that you, you're welcome to be successful, but success comes with responsibility. So the little guy will uh, start up a, a business these days, or attempt to. And your point is, uh, the little guy either can't get into the market because there, there's too many behemoths in the market. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I've also heard you in the past talk about the little guy may be only getting into the market with the intention to be bought mm -hmm. by the tech giant, by the Googles and the Amazons and the Facebooks and the Apples. So uh, is entrepreneurship something that is uh, important to you and in your scope? Do you consider that kind of at the heart of competition, letting those uh, many flowers bloom, if you will? Well, of course, that is, that is one of the points in having competition uh, laws, because what we saw all the way back in, in the 30s was that lack of competition law will tend to uh, sort of for the market to, to be characterized by monopolies. And those monopolies of the 30s, they were part and parcel of the entire catastrophe of the Second World War. And this was why sort of in these very early days uh, after the Second World War, our founding fathers, they took the inspiration from the US of the Sherman Act to say, well, we will investigate mergers, uh, cartels, misuse of dominant position. Uh, we will add to that also that a, a, a state cannot sort of privilege you, but not the rest of the businesses, uh, because that will be a threat to competition as well, and there will be a risk of misuse of market power. So it's a very long history for very good reasons, that we want the market to serve uh, us as citizens in our role as consumers, and all the businesses that are part of our value chain. And, and that has served us very well so far. So does that history explain why you and why Europe taking these actions as opposed to what we're seeing in the United States? Well, I think there can be numerous uh, reasons for that. The first obvious one, of course, is that sometimes the markets are different. 
and you may not see the same behavior. Uh, but what we have seen in Europe, uh, take the first Google case. Here we had a number of US complainants, just as well as European complainants about uh, Google behavior, uh, promoting Google shopping and demoting uh, rivals in shopping comparison on average to page four in search results. Anyone been on page four in their search results? Well, you can go, I keep all my secrets there because they're perfectly safe. Uh, no one goes there. Uh, and here you have a big guy promoting uh, a service that is in direct competition with the ones that they demote. Uh, and this is a good, if it was a small platform promoting itself, no one would notice. But since it's a dominant company promoting one of their own services, of course you see a completely different impact. You seem to have no fear uh, of the, the global nature of what you're doing. You often, I, I've heard you talk before about your purview is Europe, but you are having a major impact on the world. I think Brazil has been following your lead and taking some actions. You've clearly started a conversation in the States. Uh, Elizabeth Warren made comments that sounded very similar to some of the things that you have said uh, uh, in the past uh, couple of days. Uh, do you realize your, your role is global in this? And is that something you are seeking? Do you aspire to do? No, not at all, because I, I have a mandate. I have a task. Um, I have to, uh, well, my day job is, is to serve 500 million Europeans, which I in itself find to be, you know, quite a, quite a task. Uh, so that's, that's, that will, that do fill my day. Okay. Um, speaking of, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, speaking of your day job, uh, how much longer do you have that day job? Are you going to have a new day job soon? Well, the tradition in, in my home country, Denmark, is that uh, it is uh, the big, uh, the majority, the bigger party very often in a minority coalition government. If, if you want to know more, watch Borgen, um, who names the next commissioner. So it's, it would be quite extraordinary if I could have a second mandate. But you know, in my experience, uh, you never get something if you don't ask for it, not even a no. So, uh, so I have said, well, I would be more than happy to have another mandate as competition commissioner. And, and, <laughs> would you also be happy to have a mandate to be president of the European Commission? Is that a job that you want? Well, I have, asked, I have asked for this competition thing because we're in the middle of something. Uh -huh. um, and that is, um, I think that is actually my ambition, if at all possible. Maybe you might end up as president of the European Commission? Well, it would be a, sort of a glitch in history. It would? Yes, if a, if a woman from a rather small member state uh, could, could end up there. You know, there is a strong tradition for a man 60-ish. <laughs> uh, we were wondering uh, backstage <laughs> if we were going to talk about gender and power. And I had uh, said to the commissioner that I had, I had been openly, you know, uh, over the last many days been thinking about should we talk about gender? And part of me, um, as, I, as I told the commissioner, didn't, didn't want to bring it up. I just wanted this to be a, a conversation uh, uh, with uh, one of the most powerful regulators or people uh, in the world doing some very interesting uh, and bold things. And, um, but you thought we should talk about gender. You thought uh, there's much to say and yes. that there is much to talk about. You've been in politics for a very long time. You started when you were 21, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, not saying anything about your age, but you've just been doing this for a while. And, um, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your observations on how people see you as a, as a woman in a role of power and authority. I understand you have a, a mandate for Europe, but you're on a global stage very clearly. So uh, how's that going? 
Well, one of the things I have learned um, in these many years is that men realize that you're a woman even if you dress like a man. Um, <laughs> You know, with a, with a sort of a suit-like jacket and a white blouse and a nice string of pearls and, and a skirt, uh, they realize uh, still, you know, a man. Uh, so why bother? Uh, better, you know, better stay true to the value of diversity. And there's a lot of value to that. Because obviously, when you're all ages, genders, backgrounds, decisions are just better. So we still have an unfulfilled promise by having uh, a different way of understanding power, exercising power, enabling decisions to be much better uh -huh. because they are taken uh, in, in organizations that are much more diverse. Do you notice those gender dynamics in your, in your daily work life? Do you witness uh, ways that you are being addressed uh, or responded to differently than your male colleagues? Is that something that is on your radar that you notice and think about? Well, I think maybe just as well as I didn't realize that I was too young to do what I did when I was uh, minister the first time at 29. Um, maybe I don't really register uh, that there is a, a difference. Um, also because I always try to bring in diversity uh, where we go and where I have a role to play. And in the commission as such, we have now succeeded in having 40% plus uh, women in senior management in the commission. Uh, and to push for that, not waiting for gender quotas, not waiting for legislation, waiting for nothing but to make it happen. Uh, because we do, need, we do need change. If you, we had the stock taking uh, yesterday uh, on the 8th of March, and we still have uh, that women are paid too little compared to men, that women hold too little power compared to men. The only place where women, they get more than men is in domestic violence. Uh, that's, a, that's a really powerful observation. Thank you for that. And the worst part is that it's increasing. It's not decreasing women having to be exposed to violence in their homes. And that's a global trend. That's a global trend. Uh, okay, let me uh, go to, we, we have some good questions in, so uh, let's, let's take a few of those. Um, uh, uh, competition is probing local, DG, that must mean DC, DG? Uh, DG, I'm gonna. That's my service. That's your service, DG, okay. It's probing local search. Mm -hmm. Is Google abusing its dominance in local search and will you issue a statement of objections about that before or if you leave office? Well, this is indeed one of the things that we're looking into. Uh, we've had a lot of, uh, a number of, uh, of strong complaints in the way that Google is treating uh, local search, competing with their own, own sort of local offers. Uh, we don't know yet what it will lead to uh, because it's specific from the Google Shopping case. The one thing that sort of gives us uh, a head start is the fact that we have uh, once and for all established that Google is dominant. But I don't know uh, where we'll go, and in particular, not what when it comes to timing. Okay. Uh, let's do uh, another one or two here. Uh, you inherited, where did that go? You inherited a multi-year case after Google attempted to settle by creating links to rivals. Commissioner Almenia rejected a rival links concept. What do you think about that? Well, it was, um, it was, it was to some degree regrettable that the case couldn't be solved with commitments because what I and my uh, successors and my predecessors uh, are looking for is always how to solve a case, because we need to restore competition that businesses are not suffering. And in, in looking for a settlement with binding commitments, as Almunia did, if that could have settled the case, that would have been great, because then a number of businesses would still be here that could offer their services to, to customers. Uh, that couldn't happen for a, a number of, uh, of different reasons, so I had to 
redirect the case, and that ended up with the prohibition, the cease and desist decision, uh, the fine on top of things. Uh, now we see Google making a number of changes uh, for competition to be restored. Uh, how that will end up, uh, we have not concluded yet. You do see them making changes? Yes, we, we do see a number of changes, and we see them also testing things where we don't know where they will uh, take us yet. Okay. Um, you have a report. It, I was hoping that it would come out before we talked, uh, but it, uh, you, you have a report that has been talked about a little bit that you are working on. Uh, can, you, can you tell us about that? Tell us uh, you know, maybe any previews as to what is going to... Uh, what we might see in this report that you're coming out with at the end of the month. The nature of that report, maybe a headline or two that you could just share among us. Well, we have, I can, I can see, I have these three special advisors and, and we have challenged them, not only on substance, but also to do one report. Because it's an economist, it's a lawyer, and it's a tech person. And that is not the start of a great joke. Um, <laughs> It's hopefully the start of a great report uh, because we need them to work out one report. And if you have ever witnessed an economist and a lawyer trying to agree on something, then realizing that putting into that conversation a tech person, just on language, they're challenged. Uh, but we really want them to push us to understand issues as to data access. What does it mean? Because a lot of data is being created you really need access to test your artificial intelligence, to test your new ideas. A lot of that is for sale. But if the seller is a monopolist, then you yourself can guess the prices. So how to figure out access to data while at the same time making sure that you can invest in data and get the benefit from that. So that is one, access to data. Second, um, platforms. What role do they play? how to understand an economy that is platform-based. We always talk about the giants, but I think in Europe in itself, uh, we have like 7,000 platforms that plays a role nationally or geographically. So how to understand this way of, of an economy? And last but not least, of course, with those two elements coming through, how to uh, enable innovation? Because as said, uh, technology holds a lot of promise. Uh, and of course, we would like this to happen, but happen in a human-centered way, uh, and happen in a way so that this market still serves us uh, as citizens in our role as, uh, as customers uh, and consumers. Uh, and that takes a push, because otherwise it is the companies setting the direction of our societies. So this report, it sounds like it will um, uh, brought in a little bit from competition just pure competition into issues of data portability, perhaps? And who owns data and who controls data? You, is that right that you see that as one of the central issues for competition? It also has other ramifications, but is that a, uh, is that a new frontier for the commission's work? Well, there's a lot, there's a lot to, to be said about data, but there's also a competition side to things. Uh, because data can work as a, as, a, as a barrier to entry into a market. If you cannot get access to the data, well, you cannot access this marketplace. If you cannot get access to data, uh, you cannot test your, your new ideas. Uh, innovation will be um, uh, dampened uh, if you get also for closure when it comes to data. And if you want a dynamic marketplace, well, you have to figure out how to give access to data. Of course, also publicly owned data, things that we all as taxpayers has, uh, has provided for. Um, personal data, how to enable access to that in ways that doesn't sacrifice our privacy. Uh, so there's a lot uh, to be said, but hopefully also a lot to be done about that in the near future. So do you imagine uh, issuing more finds more statements uh, on uh, data accessibility? Well, I, I do hope that the first thing we do is for, uh, for our debates and decisions to give guidance. Because the best thing, of course, is always the deterrence. Uh, if you look at the Google cases, 
Well, then markets have changed. Market has moved on. It has been difficult. Consumers have suffered. So it's always better to have the deterrence for things not to happen. And if we are able to put in place uh, new regulation, uh, new legislation that will allow for changes, then hopefully we can change the marketplace to allow for many more players to be there and to be able to present uh, their services and, and uh, products to customers. Do you think Google should be broken up? Well, in, in Europe, we, we do have this tool in our toolbox, uh, but we see it as a, as a measure, as a very last resort. Um, because, well, breaking up a company, it's a very, very far-reaching, serious uh, thing to do. So, of course, we're trying with the casework, uh, with the cease and desist, with the follow-up, to see if, to have a, not only a legal behavior in the marketplace, but also to have a competitive marketplace. And um, as said, we, we see that there are changes. So at least for, I hope, that we will not be able to, will not have to turn to this uh, tool of very last resort. What about Facebook? Well, again, we don't, have, we don't have a Facebook case in my office. We are sort of hoovering over this market uh, as well. Uh -huh. uh, a number of national competition authorities, in particular the Germans, have had a very sort of strong focus and have had a Facebook case seen uh, through German legislation. So it plays a role, but well, we should have an issue be before we take a very serious issue. And I think, of course, the first is, is privacy. How will this develop uh, also in the Facebook universe? And do you think uh, Facebook, Google, potentially, Apple, Amazon as well, do you think they should make their algorithms transparent? Do you think they should show that openly? Is that a competitive and data issue? Well, first and foremost, of course, they have to take responsibility for what their algorithm is doing. Uh, because we can observe uh, the results of the algorithm, um, and we can then see, well, who should be held responsible for the results of that algorithm, and also for what happens when algorithms meet. Because eventually, also, there will be kind of uh, Tinder for algorithms. Uh, they will meet. Uh, they may not have had uh, a full sort of uh, law school uh, schooling to know what they can do and cannot do. Uh, and this is why I think that the most obvious first thing is to make sure that those who do algorithms, who owns them, who are human, that they take the responsibility as to what their algorithms will be doing and not just sort of referring to that to say, well, what happens in the black box remains in the black box and this is not for me, only the profits I get from it. Do you ever imagine asking them to take their algorithms out of the black box? It doesn't look like they're going to do it on their own. Right? Well, for us, what is important is how it works. Um, I hear a lot about this, oh, but you don't understand code. Well, my mandate is to make sure that we have fair competition, not to understand your code, but for you to understand your code to have fair competition. So you may not touch that. You may, you may observe uh, what... Oh, you know, part of being a law enforcer is that you never sort of say that this I will never do. You okay. just let it hang there. Okay. <laughs> How many days left do you have in the job as it stands right now? How much time do you have left if you don't do a second term? Well, you know, time is a... Uh... It's a, it's a plastic concept, it can be molded. Uh, you know, my mom, she literally looks at her watch and say, oh my God, it's Christmas again. Um, where my 16 year old, she thinks that a week spent with her parents uh, in some uh, summer cottage holiday, it's forever. So, you know, I'm trying to lean in on her sort of sense of timing so that I can get a lot of work done. And will that report, uh, it's a very good non-answer, by the way, will that, <laughs> will that report uh, 
uh, have some actions in it. Right, when, we, when we see this report that you're coming out with, with your economist and lawyer and technologist, uh, is there going to be some announcements, some further actions that you will take in your uh, remaining time? Oh, I do hope that they will, will challenge uh, us and the way we understand how we can use the tools right now. Uh, because sometimes it's not just about having new tools, it's also to use the tools you have already uh -huh. uh, in ways that shows that you can use what we have in new situations. But I, my guess would be, well, of course, it's their report, that they will also challenge us to say, well, you need these new tools or you need tools from another area that can be used in what you do. Uh, so yes, I do hope that they will be part, sort of a living, vivid part of this discussion, also with something that is specific and to be discussed and to be decided upon, are we going in that direction or not? Uh, let's uh, look at a couple more questions that we have coming in. Um, uh, we, let's look, uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, how you're taxing and how you're fining. Does the commission plan to tax the big tech companies, maybe uh, more than what you've done? Mm -hmm. uh, and for example, Google paid more fines than taxes uh, in France. Yeah, well, this is, this is one of the areas where the commission is quite ambitious uh, because not only have we seen in, in my specific cases that a number of companies has been allowed by member states to pay less than 1%, less than half a percent in taxes on, on their profits, profits uh, created in Europe. Um, but we see this also as a, as a general problem. Uh, on comparable data, we see that a digital company would pay like 9% in tax, where a traditional company would pay 23% in tax. And that's not fair competition, because they're in the same market for capital, for skilled employees, uh, sometimes for customers. So we're trying to correct that uh, by updating sort of corporate tax to be able to understand how value is created in a digital world. Uh, so far, the pushback has been quite strong. So a number of member states, they say, well, it's because it takes unanimity among the 28 member states uh, to pass this legislation. Uh, since it has had quite a strong pushback from some member states, other member states, they say, well, then we do it on our own. So, for instance, France, they have decided that they will implement uh, digital taxation this year in France. And I think it's a good thing because you need the push, but of course it's not the best situation because it's much better also for companies to know what is the general situation so it's predictable, you can foresee what are you going to pay, how is this going to play out. But the most important thing is, of course, that we hope that this European uh, initiative will push also in the OECD so that we can have a global framework. And here we, we see actually quite an interest, uh, not only from Europe, but also from other jurisdictions and actually also from the US to see, well, how can we work out a global solution to this unfair uh, difference when it comes to taxation? Do you... Uh ever uh, look across the ocean at the US and uh, just wonder, what are you guys up to? Why haven't, uh, where is uh, the action? Um, why, is, why is the United States not taking the action that, that, that we're over here taking? What, do, does it ever frustrate you? Does it ever, uh, it's a big, it's quite a big difference, right? Uh, yeah, but. You know, we, we are challenged in our own work to be sufficiently fast, which means that we sort of dedicate our working hours to our own cases instead of grading uh, colleagues. Um, I find it inspiring what the Joe Simmons of the FTC has set in motion. He is holding hearings in order to have sort of a very broad, in detail stock taking of, uh, of the US markets. Um, we follow that because we take an interest in, in, in their views, um, but that, that would be sort of, that would be our conversation. What, uh, this is a question from the audience, we touched a little bit on it earlier, but um, with uh, Elizabeth Warren's statement a few days ago uh, on breaking up Google, uh, Facebook, Amazon, uh, 
what is your take on that? And, uh, and have you met her, or do you plan to meet her? Uh, yes, I met her a, a couple of years ago. Uh, so long before uh, she ever decided to run for, uh, for president. And uh, it's because I tried to, to go to the Hill when in Washington to meet people on both sides of the aisle to get a sense of, of the debate over here, uh, which I find to have changed. Uh, actually, on both sides, I find that uh, there's a new sort of uh, curiosity uh, and, a, and a truly uh, American debates about uh, competition and, and how the marketplace uh, develops. Um, a curiosity into your... No, a curiosity into how should we here in the US go about these matters. Um, and I think that is also the way it should be. Um, but it's interesting for us to, to see that and if ever we can inspire, of course, to do that. Um, for us, breaking up companies would be sort of a very sort of a measure of their last resort. Uh, as said, we are, of course, uh, looking into to sort of the Facebook uh, marketplace. Uh, we have had one Amazon case on eBooks that was sold with binding commitments. Uh, we have had an Amazon tax case. Uh, we're now looking into the Amazon use of data uh, because they host so many companies while at the same time being a competitor to those companies. So are they using all the data they have on, on what people buy, what they're looking for, how they pay, how they ship, uh, what else, they, all of that. Um, with Google, obviously, we're now in the third uh, Google case. Uh, so we're trying to make the marketplace work and be uh, fairly fair and, and competitive, uh, but with tools that are not as, as far-reaching as breaking up the companies. Uh, these, uh, the executives for these big companies, uh, you've met some of them. Mm -hmm. I believe Tim Cook came to see you at one point. When was that? A few years ago? Yes. And he was angry. Well, we are very, all very passionate about what we do. <laughs> <laughs> She's so good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he called, uh, what did he say? He said your actions were a, a political crap or something like that, right? I believe that was the quote. Um, I, it, what, are, these, are these bad guys? Are these, uh, do you consider these uh, people who are just uh, endlessly hungry for power and money? Or do you consider them, uh, people who maybe are reaching a little bit too far but have uh, built some innovative uh, services that are hugely successful? Well, they have done something that they shouldn't. Uh, otherwise, we would not have, uh, have these fines. We would not have the evidence for uh, illegal behavior. Uh, so, of course, there's a scope to come sort of back on, on dry ground. Um, for, for me, sometimes it's a good thing to see these also as what is their business. Uh, most of them sell advertising, as advertising was also sold 10 years ago and 20 years ago and ages ago. But they're in that business in, in a way that is in a completely different category. Because with, with the data uh, and with their use of data, but we are part of their business. We are part of their production. Uh, and that, of course, is very different. Um, but I think it will sort of, it would, be, it would be wrong to say that they are good or bad. They are business people. And if they do something illegal, of course, as a law enforcer, we should be there. Uh, here's a question. Tech competition seems like a proxy for geopolitical competition. Are governments using their tech giants to control other nations? And then there's a question about, is competition law evolving? I think that's very interesting on kind of the, uh, are governments using their tech giants to control other nations, the power of these companies? What do you think? Well, that has, that has never occurred to me. Um, that's a, that's a, it's the first, this question for me. Um, I don't think so. I don't think that there is a U.S. government uh, control over the tech giants. 
um, I think contrary that it's, it's more important uh, that we in our democracies take a bigger degree of control as to what is happening when our societies digitalize. How do you think about, this was a previous question, the lobbying on this relationship between the, on the question of the relationship between the tech giants and uh, uh, the government. Uh, how do you think about the lobby work of Google and Facebook? Well, if you look at the amount of money that goes into that, well, you'd think that they, that they think it works. Uh, because otherwise it would be a very, very bad investment. Um, I don't even remember these numbers because they are huge and they are growing, the, the number uh, of money uh, going into lobbying uh, in Europe. Uh, so obviously they think that it works. We try to uh, be very transparent. Um, if, if we meet with lobbyists, it will have to be in our meeting register for people to see. Uh, lobbyists, uh, if they meet commission um, uh, civil servants or commissioners, they will have to be in our lobby register uh, in order to have transparency. Uh, because transparency is the best, best cure for excessive lobbying actually to be influential. Uh, but there is a lot of it, yes, uh, and that, of course, is also sort of, how can I put this, energizing some of our debates. Good. Uh, do you believe, here's another question, do you believe the EU tech companies are able to compete with these global giants? If there is a fair uh, and level playing field, yes, indeed, uh, I do think so. Uh, I think the European ecosystem has developed enormously over the last 15 years. Uh, and you see the interest because a number of the companies that are being bought by the giants, they are European companies. Uh, where you have great ideas uh, put into effect, uh, new technology being developed. Uh, one of the things that we are still developing in Europe, but getting there actually with quite some speed, is to have a digital single market. You had that to a completely different degree long before we did. Now we'll be getting there. And second, that we have a much better capital market because this is one of the things I really envy you uh, and one of the reasons why I think the US bounced back to the crisis was so strong uh, that you don't always go to the bank for capital. So a lot of businesses, they will go to the market for capital and they would get capital, but they would also get new competences competences that you need in order to scale your business, to grow your business, to be amazing in the marketplace. In Europe, the tradition is that you go to the bank and you create debts. And that's a completely different dynamic than going to the market, have new capital, have new people on board that take an interest, that bring in something new to your business. So we're developing uh, the, the European uh, capital market in order to be able to serve businesses to a completely different uh, level. Uh, hopefully also because of that, to make more of them stay in Europe, develop in Europe, uh, because you have a digital single market, because you have a capital market that serves you, and you have a very good place to do business. 500 million Europeans, it's a great place to do business. So that's part of the key to getting more Indeed. competition inside of Europe. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, your work on, I, I want to talk about journalism. As a journalist, I, I want to um, talk a little bit about the environment we're in and if the work that you do, uh, how it might intersect with uh, uh, free speech uh, and uh, uh, globally independent journalism. And I, the, the way I'm thinking about this question is, I look at this from the CNN uh, digital perspective where we have um, many fruitful partnerships with a lot of these tech giants. Um, I look at it uh, from just the, the position of a, of a journalist who's been in digital media for a long time and seeing some of my colleagues at other companies uh, uh, being uh, let go because their business models 
uh, we're overly reliant on the Facebook algorithm, for example, uh, or they spent a lot of time trying to game everything they could possibly game in order to get traffic from Google, mm. uh, but they also felt like a lot of the uh, revenue for their own mm. uh, businesses was being siphoned off by Google and Facebook, right? We see some of this at CNN. I feel like because of CNN's size, we don't see as much of that as CNN as you see with the other mm. smaller news organizations globally. So um, I, was I was wondering how your work, do you consider your work to have an impact on uh, uh, journalism and uh, free speech? Is that an outcome of what you do? Well, maybe indirectly, because journalists also eat. Uh, they need to be financed. A lot, by the way. <laughs> um, and, and the thing is that if the advertising market is not a fair market, well, then it's very difficult still to be a well-funded uh, news outlet, uh, actually to pay the salaries for the journalists that you hire. Uh, because the usual business model of, uh, of a, a paper would be subscriptions and advertising. Do you remember the days where the Sunday paper was something that you could hardly carry? Uh, because there would be so much advertising for real estate and jobs and all kind of stuff. All of that have changed now. And you see that when there is a growth in the advertising markets, three thirds, something like that, is by Google and Facebook. So very little is left for traditional media. Uh, in that market, you would want to have at least fair competition so that it's for sort of the right reasons uh, that so much of the advertising revenue is going to specific uh, outlets. That is one perspective. Second perspective is that uh, in Europe this year, we have been discussing issues of, of uh, copyright. Take uh, YouTube. Uh, I think very few of us go to YouTube for the advertising. Some, uh, when it's cleverly done, but most go there for the content. Uh, and so far, it has been very, very difficult for uh, journalists, uh, writers, singers, filmmakers, uh, the creative um, actors uh, as such, to get a bite of that. Because the remuneration for, for their work has been minimal, if existing. Uh, and this is why we are passing legislation that makes sure that you actually do um, remunerate people for the content that is provided. Of course, with the necessary safeguards when it comes to you know, smaller YouTube channels or uh, those who do memes or tutorials. Uh, you know, I very much like the fact that you can have you know, makeup tutorials for women over 50, um, and they will still exist when I'll be looking for tutorials for women over 60. Um, so safeguarding, of course, the creative environment, but making sure that you have a much more sort of fair uh, remuneration of the people providing what people come for and what enables all the profits made on the advertising that you see next to it. Did you just possibly say that you might get, in, you might, uh, get involved in the, in the rev share, the revenue sharing between YouTube and content providers? Well, not in my portfolio, but a, one of my colleagues uh, in the commission has provided this legislative proposal, which is now agreed upon by our parliament and our council. Uh, I think formally it will be voted upon in very uh, recent, uh, very uh, short, uh, short time in order to make sure that things are more balanced. Okay, I also heard you say another headline was that uh, you wanna feed journalists, so that just bought you a lot of good coverage. Uh, all right, uh, there's another question here. We haven't talked a lot about China, so this pops up. Uh, how would you describe the strategy of the EU and data regulation in comparison to the US, which we've talked about, we can talk about some more, uh, and to China in particular? It's, it's, well, the first thing that one would observe is that it's indeed different. Uh, because we value privacy, we value the ownership of data, um, and from our perspective, this has served as well to have, a, uh, to have human-centered 
uh, technology, to have societies that serve the citizen. And, um, and we are trying then, of course, to find ways. Because I think we also see that if you don't have the same uh, evaluation of privacy, uh, of data protection, well, then you can feed your algorithms to a completely different degree. It's a different diet. Uh, and that, of course, may bring a competitive edge if you don't have to deal with that. So we try to find other ways to say, well, maybe it will allow us to do artificial intelligence that has a different perspective, that has a perspective that is actually sort of born with the respect of the individual and the citizen. And if you look into the future, that will serve as well, because this is what we would want as citizens, because AI should still be something serving citizens and not the other way around. So we see a number of differences, uh, but that is not only when it comes to data, it is also the role that state-owned businesses uh, are playing, the access uh, to do business uh, in China compared to Europe. Uh, and my guess would be that in the coming years, you would see a somewhat more sort of hard-nosed European uh, approach when it comes to having more fairness in global competition. You, we're really here to talk about digital media, but one of the uh, one of the things that was a, a, a big deal was the uh, uh, the headlines were something along the lines of you know Vestager, uh, uh stops uh, train bus this this mm -hmm. uh, train merger that was seen in Europe as an ability to be able to compete with what's happening in mm -hmm. in China and the rest of Asia. And it was the argument train bus was going to be the Airbus of uh, high-speed trains. And you uh, 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 put a stop to that. Uh, why? Well, first of all, sort of the comparison with, with Airbus is misleading because it's now 20, 25 years ago. And we had a situation where we had uh, US uh, plane uh, producers almost non-existent in Europe. You had people be doing parts of planes and doing smaller planes. So Airbus was created to create competition. Uh, and I think that has served actually also the global economy well, that we have the competition between now uh, Boeing and, and Airbus. Um, and that is a strong com competition. In, in the rail uh, merger, what you saw was actually uh, not only European champions, but global champions. In, uh, in trains uh, merging. A lot of that had caused no problems for us whatsoever because we have a lot of competition on, on metros, on intercity trains, uh, trams, all of that. No problem whatsoever. We only had an issue in, in, in two major areas and that was mainline signaling and very high speed train. And what we then do when we see that, oh, we will lose competition in these very important markets, one for security, second, to get us go by train and not always fly, uh, would there be someone else to turn to if choice is limited, if prices go up? Problem is, it's very difficult to see. And here we look five, 10 years into the future and find that, well, there's no prospect of Chinese competitors coming in uh, to this market. And then if the loss of competition cannot be solved by the companies and it is their choice, then, unfortunately, we'll have to prohibit the murder. Um, you, on balance, I'm looking at our time and we're getting close to the end. On balance, uh, you, you sound uh, hopeful. Uh, you, you sound like uh, there's this uh, sense of uh, possibility that, uh, mm -hmm. there, uh, that we might be able to better uh, control our future, our our data, our ability to, uh, as consumers, live in kind of a vibrant marketplace. Um, as most of us see technology kind of uh, barreling towards us with all of its uh, dark and light side, as you said. Uh, uh, is that right? Are you, uh, are, do you see a, a positive future? Do you see a hopeful outcome here? Well, of course, we have a very long to-do list of problems that has to be solved. But I think there's room to be much more confident uh, because we, we really have made it. 
uh, of course, this is Europe-centered, but I do think that Europe is the best place to live ever in history in the world, especially if you're a woman. And, and it's not for nothing. It has come because we have, we have developed, we have worked together, we have used technology, our democracy, our markets to push for this to happen. So if we were much more confident about the skills that we have, the tacit knowledge we have about how to make things happen, of course we can solve all of that on the to-do list of, of problems. Uh, and especially, of course, we would like to do that with like-minded people, which is why we're here, because we have a transatlantic friendship, and we would like to build on that. Is there anything else you would like to add as you're uh, sitting on the stage here in Texas for the very first time? Not, well, just the obvious, that it's great to come together instead of just being on your screen in your own little bubble, in your own isolation, uh, being manipulated or whatever, manipulating others. I think that this is, this is great because here you can test with your human skills if I am right or I am wrong or if you just plainly disagree. And I hope that we will never, ever leave our democracy to social media. Commissioner Vestager.